Our gospel reading this morning comes to us from the gospel according to Mark chapter, five, or chapter 10, beginning in verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. may be seated. Grace and peace to you this morning from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So just about every night I read our two-year-old Paul a couple of books. It's just kind of part of his bedtime routine. And I don't remember how, or a couple months ago, we got this one new book in particular. I don't know how we got it, um, but the author is Kathy Lee Gifford. Maybe that name's familiar to some of you. She used to be the co-host of uh, Live with Regis and Kathy Lee. And so evidently in her retirement, she has started to write children's books. Uh, This one particular that we got is called Hello Little Dreamer, is what it's called. And I... I brought it up here with me, if only because I want to read the first couple lines to you, just so you kind of get the gist of it. It's going to kind of set up the rest of the sermon. So let me read, uh, Hello, Little Dreamer. It's not scripture, but we're going to read it. It sounds fun. I feel like an elementary school librarian up here. This is great. Uh, So it says, Hello, Little Dreamer. What is your favorite thing to do? Do you like to sing songs or watch animals at the zoo? Do you like to count numbers or gaze at stars in the sky? You're like a STEM kid, right? Do you like to count numbers or gaze at stars in the sky? Uh, You may know what you like, but do you really know why? Well, the answer is simple. Is it though? Well, the answer is simple. It began long ago. Before you were born, your dreams started to grow. God planted these dreams way down deep in your heart. Some big and some little, right from the start. And he had a good reason to do this, you see. I want to know the reason, don't you? Like, what's, why? Uh, And he had a good reason to do this, you see. It's so you you could become all that you're meant to be. Yeah? Okay. Uh, So kind of the basic message of the book. I like the book. Maybe you guys don't. Uh, Kind of the basic basic message of the book. If you want to know who you really are, and more specifically, if you want to know what God really created you to do in this life, all you've got to do is look at your dreams. Oh, so here's the thing about that. No. No. In fact, ever, the first time I read this to Paul, I'm like, no, buddy, don't listen to that. It's not biblical. We're never going to read it again. I chucked it across the room, right? Uh, and yet kind of the issue I've been having is he loves that book. Uh, like pretty much every night we're reading other books and he always goes, I want Little Dreamer. Uh, So I have to go, no more Little Dreamer. No more Little Dreamer. Why? Kathy Lee Gifford is a heretic. And he just starts to like cry and lose it. And it's a horrible night. I'm just kidding about the last part. I'm much more passive aggressive. I just hide the book under the bed and pretend that we lost it. Like, oh. Uh, Either way, I'm not going to read it. You want Little Dreamer? That's great. How about Romans? Maybe Lamentations. Like, so much for your dreams. Um, anyway, a couple weeks ago, after the kids go down, I'm in the kitchen doing dishes. Uh, and when I do dishes, kind of my thing, I like to put in ear, uh, like headphones and listen to either a podcast or a sermon. And so this one particular night, I'm listening to a sermon by a guy named John Mark Comer. 
I've quoted him a couple times in sermons. He's a pastor up in Portland. You see, the sermon I'm listening to, it's all about discerning your calling, which has my interest piqued because that's what our current sermon series is. I'm like, I want to hear what he has to say. It's about discerning your calling, and yet what he goes into in this sermon are all these instances in the Bible where the, God, the way that God leads people into their calling is by what? Dreams. It's like, oh no, you too? <laughs> Uh, as you could probably tell, I'm not totally open to this, uh, but he is just rifling through one example after another. And the thing is, I don't know how I missed it, but it's literally all over the place. Where God gives someone a dream precisely in order to lead them into their calling. From Jacob's Ladder, for instance, where there's a bridge between heaven and earth, after which Jacob and his people essentially become that bridge. That ladder between heaven and earth. In other words, his dream became his calling. To Solomon's dream of being able to get whatever he wants. And he gets wisdom in particular, after which he becomes the giver of wisdom to the rest of the world. He wrote the book of Proverbs, which tells us his dream became his calling. To the Old Testament, Joseph, our Old Testament reading, having a dream that his brothers are going to bow down to him. His dream became his calling. To the New Testament, Joseph, where he's going to, or he has a dream that he's going to raise the Son of God, which he totally does. His dream became his calling. And so you see, there is instance after instance after instance of this. And I was reading about it this past week, just kind of trying to research this topic, but there are, in fact, 21 different accounts in the Bible of God giving someone a dream the point of which is almost always to lead them into the future he has planned for them. And so I don't know about you. I said I typically find myself closed off to such things, and yet I think the Bible is saying something about discerning what it is we're called to. And in particular, that your hopes and your dreams, so not just literal dreams, but also your hopes, Your hopes and your dreams, those things are, in fact, often indicative of what God is calling you to. And not to be misheard, not every dream we have always comes from God. Nor is every kind of hope always a good thing. We definitely need to be discerning in this. And so I'm not saying all of us should just follow our dreams. I'm not saying that. Uh, But what I am saying is all of us ought to be paying attention. And praying over these things. Has God given you a dream for your life? More likely, multiple dreams. If only because we have multiple callings in this life. But what are your dreams? Do you have any? And if so, do any of them seem distinctively God given? And the way you can tell is three things. I'm going to get into the meat of, a ser- in the ser- of the sermon in a second, but I want to be able to kind of discern what is a God-given dream. How do you tell? Uh, but three things. One is it inspires hope for the future, which I think almost all dreams do. It's kind of the basic requirement of it being a dream, not a nightmare. Um, so it inspires hope for the future as one. But two, it makes you want to love and serve God more. In other words, it leads you into greater surrender. And then three, if and when God God gets you there into that dream, it's going to be a blessing and benefit to other people. Uh, So it's not just going to be about getting famous or rich, like, I will surrender to that. Like, all right. Uh, But no, it's going to be about other people getting blessed in and through the calling that God has put you in. Do you have dreams that kind of fit that? So what we're going to do for the rest of this is we're going to look at the way that God fulfills dreams. And in particular, we're going to be sitting with that story of Joseph. That was our Old Testament reading. And if you remember the reading, the, the dream that God himself had given to Joseph was that his brothers were going to come and bow down to him. And the thing is, eventually, that is exactly what happens. In spite of the fact that his brothers are totally against that. Uh, his brothers come into this room in Egypt. There's a famine in the land. Joseph's got a bunch of grain that they need. And not even knowing who he is, they bow down to him. And so the dream totally comes true, and yet here's the thing about it. The way that God gets them there is dramatically different from what Joseph expected. Uh, And in particular, there are three huge differences. First of all, it is way harder. Second of all, it takes much longer. And third of all, it is far better. 
And we're going to spend the rest of our time in this message going through all three of those. So harder, longer, better. Let's start with the first one, which is the way that God fulfills the dreams he's given us is almost always going to be way harder than we ever expected. Uh, so my engagement to Christy was just a little over seven months. And during that time, we were very dreamy about our future together. I'm kind of a dreamy guy to begin with, so clearly she was dreaming about it. I can't even say it with a stage phrase. Sorry, <laughs> it's a bad joke. Uh, maybe not, but the point is we had a very clear hope for and excitement about our future together, okay? And yet what was weird is almost everyone we knew who was already married just started kind of issuing, war- from the second we were engaged, they started kind of issuing us warnings about marriage. Like, oh my goodness, do you not like being married? Wait, to- <laughs> tell us you don't without telling us. Um, Anyway, in particular, at Christie's wedding shower, they did these three-by-five index cards with marriage advice on each of them. So each person kind of filled them out, and literally none of the advice that we got felt very dreamy. Much less did it feel hopeful about marriage. It was like, marriage is just a lot of work. There you go. It's going to be really hard. You're going to have to make a lot of compromises. You're going to sacrifice a ton. You're going to get angry with each other, but the key to that is you're never going to go to bed angry, right, is the advice. And so to be honest, it was all this stuff that just felt like kind of a buzzkill. Uh, And yet, in our minds, we were thinking that is so not going to be us. It's not going to be us. Uh, We're not going to have to work at it. Uh, Marriage is going to be easy for us. We don't have to worry about going to bed angry, if only because we're never going to get angry. For us, marriage is just going to be awesome. For goodness sakes, it's our dream to marry each other. And the nature of a dream is that it's easy. Right? So what happened? Two months after getting married, we moved across the country to Pittsburgh. That was not part of our plan. Uh, Part of our dream was actually to live in a really cool part of central Phoenix called Arcadia. It's got a bunch of cool restaurants and nightlife. It's kind of a young adults neighborhood. We were really pumped about that. And yet instead of that, God called us to the other side of town, and by town I mean the United States of America, um, we found ourselves living in a place called Baldwin Borough, which is about as exciting as the name sounds. Uh, We went from the sunniest place in America to one of the gloomiest. Uh, We didn't know anyone there. We barely knew each other. And to be totally honest, life was just hard the first couple years we were there. Uh, We were stressed out at work. We were financially unstable, trying to figure out how to do this thing called marriage. And yet, of course, through it all, we never fought. (laughs) Married people, you're laughing. (laughs) Uh, So one of the things we loved about each other when we dated is how different we were. Uh, The thing about me and Chrissy is we're very much the opposite of each other in a lot of ways. And early on, that was like part of the attraction, right? The old saying is opposites... Opposites attract, I was saying. And yeah, I remember hearing a Rick Warren sermon about marriage, and this is a couple years into it for us. Uh, And he was talking about his own marriage. He and his wife Kay are totally opposites as well. And what he said is, what I found is opposites attract, and then they attack. (laughs) Well, it would have been nice to know that beforehand. Like, (laughs) Uh, and so the first couple years of our marriage, if we're just being honest, neither of us was thinking this looks exactly like the dream. No, it was hard. It was hard. And the thing about dreams, they're not supposed to be hard. Am I right? No, I'm not right. Uh, So let's go to Joseph and his dream. The thing is, the path by which uh, God fulfills that dream is anything but easy. In fact, almost everything Joseph expected as part of of his dream is the exact opposite of how it actually unfolds. So for instance, Joseph thought he was going to be above his brothers. They throw him into a pit, now he's below his brothers. It's the exact opposite of the dream. He thought that he was going to reign and rule over people. They sell him as a slave, now he's reigned and ruled over by people. Exact opposite of the dream. He thought he was going to be be rooted at home and surrounded by people that he knew. He goes down to Egypt, now he's not at home and he's surrounded by people that he has no clue who they are. It's the exact opposite of the dream. So you see, everything in Joseph's dream is exactly the opposite of what he expected. And in particular, it was way harder. And we're not focusing as much on our New Testament reading today, uh, but if you kind of look real quick at it, James and John, they come to Jesus. They seem to have the same sort of mindset as Joseph in regards to dreams. In particular, they go to Jesus and they say, we want to get glory. 
Could you imagine? They come to you, we want to get glory. In other words, we want our lives to be great. That's what glory is. Your life is great. I love Jesus' response to them. He says to them, you do not know what you're asking for. You've got a dream. You don't know what you're asking for. And you see, what he's getting at is what they think is the road to glory is paved with comfort and ease. That that is the dream life. And yet the path of Christ is anything but that. It's hard. It's messy. It's not exactly what any of us would deem dreamy. And yet here's the thing. When it comes to our dreams, whereas hardship might not be part of our plan, it is definitely part of God's but it's my dream. It shouldn't be hard. No. If it's God's dream, the fulfillment of it is almost always hard. And so the thing is, if your path gets hard, that does not mean something's gone wrong or that something is wrong. It does not mean that God is not still sovereign. It does not mean that you're outside of his will. It does not mean that you took a wrong turn or other people have the power to mess up God's plan or ruin his purpose for you. None of that is true. It just means he is fulfilling your dream in a way that is way harder than you expected. That's it. And he's got a very good reason for doing it that way, which is not going to be until the third point, so we're going to have to kind of like wait, uh, but just trust me in the meantime, a hard path is always going to end up being better than than if the road were just easy peasy for us. So that's the first thing. The way that God fulfills dreams is almost always going to be a lot harder than we would wish for. Let's go to the second thing, which is the way that God fulfills dreams is almost always going to take longer than we thought it would. Uh, So a lot of you know Christy works for American Eagle. Their corporate office is based out of Pittsburgh. Um, When we moved across the country back here, they allowed her to keep her job remotely. Uh, And see, one of the things that's happened more recently, it's kind of like a 2022 hiring spree. So there's like this bevy of new employees. They've hired a bunch of new people in the new year, most of whom are incredibly young. Uh, The funny thing about American Eagle is Christy is at 38. She's like a dinosaur there. No no offense, sorry. (laughs) Uh Uh-oh. But no, everyone, like, you kind of age out up there. Everyone is, like, 22, 23 years old. And so by incredibly, I mean, like, fresh out of college, right? And you see, what Christy has kind of picked up on is there's this palpable impatience that they have. They're so impatient. What I mean by that is some of them will have literally been there for four months, and they're asking for a promotion. Like, my dream is to be the CEO. And it's like, okay, when's that going to happen? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, duh. And so what often, that often means is turnover is super high. People are always just kind of bouncing from one thing to the next. And even if they're not, it always kind of feels like there's this restlessness under the surface. Where people are prone to jump ship the second they get the chance. So here's the thing about that. You might think this is just, quote unquote, young people these days. We find ourselves saying, that, oh, young people these days is what we say at home. And yet, no, it's not. In fact, social commentators have been talking about this for like the last 20 to 30 years, writing about it. Uh, The fact that this has become somewhat of a culture-wide phenomenon. In fact, one of the most brilliant minds on this, there's a Polish philosopher by the name of Zygmunt Bowman. Zygmunt Bowman is his name. And kind of the phrase he's used to coin the era that we live in of human history is what he calls liquid modernity. And what he means by that is there's there's really very little that's solid or stable anymore meaning everything's changing at a really rapid pace. And in particular, what Bowman is picking up on is especially when it comes to relationships, identities, and communities, things that we typically root ourselves in for the long haul. We live in an era of constant mobility and change. Everything's in flux. In other words, very little commitment to particular places, people, or projects. And this isn't isn't just him making this up, like as a philosopher commentating on it. Uh, Studies totally bear it out as well. That we move much more frequently than ever before. We also change jobs much more often than ever before. We end marriages much more quickly. We change friends much more rapidly. We move across the country much more easily. Although we're, uh, altogether, we're just not very rooted as a people. We're like liquid, he says. And according to Bowman, we used to kind of conceive of ourselves as pilgrims in search of deeper meaning. That's how human beings used to think of themselves. In which case, it was really helpful to stay put. 
And yet our view now, he contends, is that we're much more like tourists in search of a better experience. In which case, you just got to keep moving on, right? Get to the next thing. And you see, this is not Bowman, but I would contend that what's often driving that is a dream. It's a dream. Meaning an image of the future that we aspire to, that we want for our lives. And kind of the assumption of this era is the way to fulfill a dream is to chase it. Meaning keep switching until you find it. This isn't your dream, just keep switching. Move on. And yet here's the thing. What if the way that God fulfills dreams is totally different from that? And in particular, what if his way of fulfilling dreams is really slow and drawn out? Meaning he takes much longer to make dreams a reality and therefore the call of every dream isn't constantly to bounce and break free from things, but to be patient and to persevere. So you go to Joseph, Old Testament reading. He has this dream that his brothers are going to bow down to him, right? And the thing about this dream, the fulfillment of it takes a total of 14 chapters, Genesis 37 to Genesis 50. And if you've read the Old Testament, 14 chapters is like an eternity in the Bible. You can add up the years. It's actually 22 years total that it takes, as Pastor Matt, Pastor Matt mentioned in the children's talk, uh, 13 of which, this is worth emphasizing, 13 of those 22 years were spent as a prisoner or a slave, What that means is he went long, a long stretch of time during which he could not see any progress toward his dream. In other words, his life seemed totally idle. His circumstances seemed absolutely pointless. His hardships seemed to serve no purpose at all. And yet while Joseph's life appeared to be stuck, God's hand was not stuck. Just think about your life. It appears to be stuck at certain moments, right? What you see in Joseph, God's hand is not stuck. And so you see, while Joseph was just praying and persevering through what seemed like a totally pointless time, unbeknownst to him, God was working and weaving everything together for his good. And so just to put the question out there, what ought we to do when our current reality does not match the dream that we had? Not always, but almost always. You just stay put. And you wait on the Lord. It's like, but I've got a dream, and this is not it, right? Uh, Yeah, but if it's a dream from God, it cannot be rushed. And I get it. Sometimes it's going to feel like your life is not moving anywhere. And yet God is moving in the midst of that. And you see, the the key to seeing his hand is to wait and to watch as he weaves and he works. Joseph totally saw it. He saw God work. Here's the caveat. It was only in hindsight. Only in hindsight do you see him work. And so for now, we walk by faith, not by sight, which means not always but often we stay exactly where God has planted us. Instead of trying to force his hand into something that he is much slower to give. So that's the second thing. The way that God fulfills the dreams he's given us is almost always going to take longer than we expect. So longer, harder, and finally, some better news, better. (laughs) It's better. I mean, the way that God fulfills the dreams he's given us is always going to be better. Not almost always, but always going to be better than what we had hoped for. Uh, So just about a week ago, on my 10-year anniversary of being a pastor, Uh, Believe it or not, I had dreamt off and on of becoming a pastor from just about a month after coming to faith. I was a high school senior, 17 years old, and one of my youth pastors said, I ought to think about it. So one year of high school, four years of college, three years of some really odd jobs, which included plumbing, selling women's shoes at Nordstrom, and substitute teaching, i.e., live in the dream, (laughs) followed by four years of seminary, and 12 years later, in August of 2012, I got ordained in this sanctuary. Um, I was a member here right after college for a brief time. And you may have seen it on social media, um, but we posted a picture of it for that day. Um, And if you saw the picture, that was me at the ripe old age of 
16 is what a lot of people would have guessed, right? It's like, oh my goodness, really? Um, but no, I'm 29 in that photo. The very next week, I was moving to Scottsdale, Arizona to be the associate pastor at a church there. Uh, so the other, other day, what we did is we showed uh, our little Paul the picture of this, and we said, uh, do you know who that is? We're like, who's that, right? Who's that? And he kind of looked at it like, incredibly confused, furrowed brow, all that. And then he goes, Pastor Daddy? <laughs> Uh, a, he's never called me that before, Pastor Daddy. Uh, but B, by the way he said it, I think he could barely recognize me in the photo. That's a little disheartening. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the pictures of Barack Obama when he first started the presidency and then when he finished eight years later. It's like, oh my goodness, what happened? Eight years, aged him 80. Like, pastoral ministry can kind of feel like that sometimes. Don't get me wrong, we work one day a week, it's a great gig, and what could be stressful about it? I don't know. Um, so moving on. Anyway, I think back to starting out as a pastor. Uh, my first couple years of ministry, I'll be honest, the way that I saw myself, and this is going to be like... It's embarrassing to say this. I'll say it anyway. But I kind of saw myself as something like God's gift to the church. See, because I had all this seminary education, I was going to fix all the church's problems. I thought I was going to be this amazing pastor. Right? And so when I first started, a lot of my ministry was all about me. It's all about me. And the thing is, in that first call... That was easy to fall into. Uh, it was a really big church, about 2,000 per, pe- uh, 2,000 per week in worship. And so in particular, you get up there to preach and you've got this huge audience, huge audience, uh, which never made me nervous, by the way. I just wouldn't put in my contacts and I couldn't see anyone. I was like, what's going on right now? Um, but what they would do, so huge audience, they would put you up big on the screen, right? So everyone in the back could see, they blow you up on the screen. And the thing is, for me, it would just totally feed my ego. See, I don't think I saw it at the time, but looking back, I had taken the dream that God had given me of becoming a pastor, and I'd imported all, into it all sorts of fallen desires and motivations. A year and a half in, and I was well on my way to becoming an unbearable narcissist. And yet, here's what happened. By God's grace, I got fired. I got fired two years in. And most first calls, like, they're much longer than two years. All my friends were still in their first call. I got fired two years in. Uh, and the senior pastor pushed me out, and he told me I was a D-minus pastor on the way out. Uh, which, by the way, totally popped that balloon. Like, Poosh, there goes all that hot air. I'm like, all right, there you go. Uh, and after that, I ended up the, as the associate pastor at a dramatically smaller church. This is the one in Pittsburgh. Maybe 70 to 75 people per service located in a community that was the exact opposite of the Ritz and Glitz of Scottsdale. It was predominantly blue-collar, relatively uneducated, lower-middle-class congregation, all of which is to say it was very humbling to be sent there. And at one point, I became the senior pastor there, which is like, oh, maybe that'll boost your morale. Uh, The previous senior pastor had left, I became the senior pastor, but that was even more humbling. You see, because I thought I was going to be great, I was horrible as a pastor. It was way harder than I thought it was going to be. And so I was kind of having to reevaluate my motives at this point for why I'm doing this. And this one day in particular, I had a home communion visit. It was for an elderly woman who'd been part of that church for 70 years. She had been part of that church. That church was founded in 1800, so they've got some long or some deep roots. Uh, she lived, lived at the end of a remote cul-de-sac in a poor part of town called Carrick. And she still lived by herself, in spite of the fact that she would die just two weeks later. Uh, so I come into the house, and it's just me and her. No more 2,000 in front of you, right? Just me and her. And we do communion, and as I say, the body of Christ given for you, a lot of people say, a lot of people say amen. Some of you guys say thank you. I'm like, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, but she said, Never forget it. She said, thanks be to God. I don't know what it was, but as I left, it was like God had opened my eyes to something. To what? Uh, To the meaning of the dream. Namely, that it was not about me and people feeding my ego, but that it was about God and feeding his people grace. And so it is with every dream that God gives us. It's not about us and feeding our ego. It is about God and giving people grace. 
So you go to Joseph and the dream that he had. It's a God-given dream that one day his brothers are going to come in and they're going to bow down to him. And for whatever reason, he takes that to be all about him. Uh, that he's going to rule over them and it's going to be all about feeding his ego, right? Uh, and yet you get to the end and that's not at all what it's about. See, the reason they bow down is there's a famine in the land, for goodness sakes. Everyone's kind of starving. That's why his brothers come to him in the first place. He's in charge of giving out the grain. They don't even know that it's him. They come in, they're totally desperate, and they just bow down, right? You see, what does Joseph realize in that moment? He was wrong. He's known in the Bible as being this great interpreter of dreams. He interpreted that one poorly. Meaning he thought the dream was about him ruling his brothers, but that's not what it was. It was about him serving them. The reason they're bowed down is so he can serve them. And so instead of them feeding his ego, he is called to feed them grace. Grain also, but in the feeding of the grace, he's, if grain, he's feeding them grace is what he's doing. And that is the dream God had dreamt all along. And so you see, after walking down a path that was way longer and much harder than he ever expected. Joseph sees it. Do you see it in your callings? Uh, at home, got a calling there. At work, got a calling there. That there is, in fact, a famine in the land, so to speak. And what I mean is, while we perhaps dream of feeding our egos, the reality is people out there are starving for grace. And all the dreams God has given us and all the callings he's placed upon us are for precisely that reason. And I would argue that's far better than we could ever hope for. It is, after all, far more blessed to give to give grace, that is, than to receive glory, that is. Uh, so just kind of wrap this up. Uh, one thing it says about Joseph, as you get to the end of Genesis, it's Genesis 37 through 50, one thing it says towards the end of the story is God is kind of bringing this whole dream to its culmination. When Joseph's brothers come in and bow down, it says they don't recognize him anymore. And the thing is, you could take that in a totally natural sense, like, it's just been a really long time and they forgot what he looked like, I don't know. And yet, I do not think that's what it's saying. I think what it's saying is he's changed. He's changed. That the long and hard path by which God has led him has so shaped him that he's not even recognizable anymore. He's far kinder. He's much more gracious. He's 100% more humble. God has totally transformed him. And so you see, the thing about a God-given dream is the reason God almost always leads us down a path that's hard and long is, that, is so that in the end, people would look at you and perhaps you would even look at yourself and the old you would bear but a faint resemblance to the man or woman you have become. And so I want to encourage you today that as you pray over and pay attention to your dreams, perhaps even pursue those which seem God-given, at the same time you also be patient and persevering as God does his work in you. He is working. Is it a long process? For sure. Is it a hard process? Absolutely. And yet, does any of that mean that it's worse or that it's not the dream that God intends for you? Emphatically not. We can't see it at the time, but God is doing something far greater and better than we could have ever expected. And so thanks be to God. Let's pray so our worship team comes forward. Uh, Father, we thank you for the dreams that you've given your people. Uh, that you've laid them on our hearts so that we might be led into the purpose and plan you have for us. And we pray that you would help us to see those dreams for what they are. Um, and as you lead us down that path that is often long and hard, uh, that you would keep us patient and prayerful, God. 
and help us to see uh, that the dream is not about us. It's not, uh, but rather it's about you and about serving your people. Pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.